still delighted, in fact. No. <laughs> Delight. Setting up our meeting for YouTube Live. It's all gonna happen. All right. Here it goes. Hey. Here it goes. Here it goes. Hey. Hey. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our live stream. I just asked everybody where they're tuning in from. Oh, I can't. Um, I got to mute myself. Okay. Uh, Aubrey, I've asked everybody where they're tuning in from. And we've got Jersey City, Whoa. Northern California, Victoria, BC, Maine, Austria, Tel Aviv, Israel. Oh my, Glasgow, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Hillsboro, North Carolina, Chicago, my bedroom, all the places. Oh, so many places. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. We are so excited. We're doing a whole week of live streams this week from our yes. shelters in place. Um, and this morning is a very exciting morning because we are interviewing uh, the author of some of our very, very favorite books. Uh, That's right. Yes. So if you don't know us, by the way, I am Laser They Them. This is Aubrey She Her. We are We're related. Called, we are. We're siblings. And we are a band called The Double Clicks. And our guest bum, 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 is the incredible Becky Chambers. Yay! Hello, hello. Becky, thank you so much for joining us. My absolute pleasure. We are so excited that you're here. Uh, thank you for your books. Thank you for taking time away from your books to do this live stream. Your first ever live stream. Congratulations. My first ever live stream. Baby's first live stream. How's it feeling so far? So far, so good. I mean, so far, it just feels like my office, oh, but okay. with a lot of people in it. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can see Thanks. everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for uh, having us in your office. Yeah. Oh, yes. Welcome. I cleaned this side of it for you. It looks great. Um, thank you. This yeah. side that you can't see is as it always is. So yeah. excellent. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I have a very strategic, like this part is where the garbage <laughs> is. Like I hide things behind other things. It's great. Um, but you know, it's great. Well, well, folks, I'm going to do, a, I'm going to read Becky's bio just in case for some reason you haven't read the books yet and don't already know which you will be doing immediately after this yes. live stream um, I envy you. <laughs> all right here we go <laughs> becky chambers is a science fiction author based in northern california she is best known for her hugo award winning wayfarer series we fear series which currently includes the long way to a small angry planet a closed in common orbit and record of a space-born view her books have also been nominated for the Arthur C. Clarke Award, the Locus Award, and the Women's Prize for Fiction, among others. Her most recent work is To Be Taught If Fortunate, a standalone novella. Becky has a background in performing arts and grew up in a family heavily involved in space science. She spends her free time playing video and tabletop games, keeping bees, and looking through her telescope. Having hopped around the world a bit, she's now back in her home state where she lives with her wife. She hopes to see Earth from orbit one day. Welcome, Becky. Thank Yay. you. Uh, well, that is, this is addressed a little bit in the bio we just read, but what is your, your writing origin story and your sci-fi origin story? I mean, I've been writing since I was itty bitty. I can't, I can't remember. Well, I mean, I'm sure there was a point in which I didn't write other than like crayon on the wall or something, but um, no, I've just, I, it's always been uh, how I, how I communicate and what I like to do. And sci-fi, I can't remember not loving sci-fi. I, I, I joke about this, but it's not a joke. I can't remember life before Star Trek, like Next Generation aired when I was two and a half years old. I've never not had that and Star Wars in my life. So um, the two together just were a natural merging of, of uh, my entire existence. <laughs> so Very familiar. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, so when, does, when, when do novels start coming into that? Uh, so I started, so my, my first novel was The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet. Oh, wow. Okay. And yeah. Um, and so I, I started working on that in, well, I started cobbling together bits and pieces of that in college. Um, the, 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 the story goes that I, um, I had a really boring job on campus um, and I worked at the gym and I'm not a gym person and I worked the 6 a.m. shift, which is 
not an hour that I'm awake. And my job was just to swipe people in at the front desk. And it was super, super, super boring. Um, so one day I was making up aliens and like you do. Sure. And, uh, and so I made, I made up this, this lizard lady and I was like, I kind of like her. I should make, give her some friends and now I should give them a spaceship. And now I need to figure out their whole deal. And that's where it all began. And so that just sort of sat there in the back of my noodle for, um, 10 years or so until I decided to sit down and, and put it all together. So um, 2012 was when I, uh, I I finally wrote that thing and then it, it came to be in 2014. Um, so yeah, so it, it was um, a, 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 a long uh, gestation period um, awesome. to get it going. But yeah, um, it was uh, something I always wanted to do, and I'm very, very lucky to uh, to have this be my job now. So that's awesome. That's so great. Well, your your latest work, as we said, is to be taught at Fortunate. Your titles are amazing, by the way. Um, would you be willing to read us a little bit from it? Right now? I would absolutely. Excellent. I happen to have it right here. Wow! Wow! Oh, completely unplanned. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, to be taught, if fortunate, I'll be reading from this, which is the UK version. This is the US version. They're very different covers, uh, but equally good. This one just has more vowels in it, but they're exactly the same. Um, so the bit I will be reading from uh, is near the beginning of the book, and it's a novella, so it's a nice, nice slim read. Um, this is from the point of view of a character named Ariadne, who is an astronaut living um, about a century from now. Um, she and her crew are currently on an away mission uh, 14 years, oh, 14 light years, excuse me, from Earth and um, performing an ecological survey of an exoplanetary system. Uh, in this bit, she is talking in retrospect about joining the space program. Uh, the organization in question is called OCA, which stands for Open Cluster Astronautics. And that is all you need to know to dive in. In terms of formal training, I'm not a scientist. I'm an engineer. I build the machines and provide the propulsion that gets scientists where they need to go. I'm a support class, in essence. I've always felt most comfortable in that role. The day I applied for trainee work at OCA, just shy of 19, I walked in the door of the Vancouver campus with no thought beyond keeping my feet firmly on the ground. I imagined a life of craning my neck back as my work vanished into the clouds. I had no idea how far I would go, but then I'm not sure OCA knew that about itself either. It's understandable why humans stopped living in space in the 2020s. How can you think of the stars when the seas are spilling over? How can you spare thought for alien ecosystems when your cities are too hot to inhabit? How can you trade fuel and metal and ideas when the lines on every map are in flux? How can anyone be expected to care about the questions of worlds above when the question of the world you're stuck on, those most vital criteria of home and health and safety remain unanswered? Keeping probes and satellites spinning is one thing. Keeping astronauts alive is quite another. In the throes of the great shift, there were none with sufficient stable resources, human, monetary, or material, to keep that latter work going. Even if there had been, those who held the purse strings so often had motives beyond the glorious dawns they claimed to support. If you wanted the funding and facilities for spaceflight, you could either appeal to your government, whose support for the sciences might prove hollow as soon as there wasn't a war to win, or to a corporate entity, which would chase scientific progress provided that there was a positive correlation to their bottom line. So much for the benefit of all mankind. For the people who worked on those programs, the astronauts, yes, and the breakthrough scientists, yes, but also the thousands upon thousands of everyday engineers, mathematicians, doctors, lab grunts, and data hounds whose names and stories are lost to us, these were not the futures they were chasing. They'd been sold on a vision of discovery and progress accessible to everyone, a global mindset, an enlightened humanity. Instead, they found that dream inextricably, cripplingly anchored to the very fonts of nationalistic myopia and materialistic greed that said dream was antithetical to. 
I imagined many despaired at this reality and perhaps lost heart. But our history remembers those that did the opposite. People of science, after all, are stubborn beyond the point of sense. Have you ever been in a place where history becomes tangible? Where you stand motionless, feeling time and importance press around you, press into you? That was how I felt the first time I stood in the astronaut garden at Oka PNW. Is it still there? Do you know it? Every Opa campus had, has, please let it be has one, a circular enclave walled by smooth white stone that towered up and up until it abruptly cut off, definitive as the end of an atmosphere, making room for the sky above. Stretching up for the ground, standing in neat rows and with an equally neat carpet of micro clover in between, were trees, one for every person who'd taken a trip off Earth on an Oka rocket. It didn't matter where you were from, where you trained, where your spacecraft launched. When someone went up, every Oka campus planted a sapling. The trees are an awesome sight, but bear in mind, the forest above is not the garden's entry point. You enter from underground. I remember walking through a short tunnel and into a, long, a low lit dome chamber that possessed nothing but a spiral staircase leading upward. The walls were made of thick glass and behind it was the dense network you find below every forest. Roots interlocking like fingers with gossamer fungus sprawled symbiotically between, allowing for the, the peaceful exchange of carbon and nutrients. Worms traversed roads of their own making. Pockets of water and pebbles decorated the scene. This is what a forest is, after all. Don't believe the lie of individual trees, each a monument to its own self-made success. A forest is an interdependent community. Resources are shared, and life in isolation is a death sentence. As I stood contemplating the roots, a hidden timer triggered and the lights faded out. My breath went with it. The glass was etched with some kind of luminescent colorant, invisible when the lights were on, but glowing boldly in the dark. I moved closer and I saw names, thousands upon thousands of names printed as small as possible. I understood what I was seeing without being told. The idea behind open cluster astronautics was simple, citizen funded space flight, exploration for exploration's sake apolitical, international, nonprofit, Donations accepted from anyone with no kickbacks or concessions or promises of anything beyond a fervent attempt to bring astronauts back from extinction. It began in a post thread kicked off in 2052, a literal moonshot by a collective of frustrated friends from all corners, former thinkers from big names gone bankrupt, starry-eyed academics who wanted to do more than teach the past, government bureau members whose governments no longer existed. If you want to do good science with clean money and clean hands, they argued, if you want to keep the fire burning even as flags and logos came down, if you understand that space exploration is best when it's done in the name of the people, then the people are the ones who have to make it happen. And we did. Their names are on the root level glass, those original 12 in font no bigger than any other. So are the names of everyone who has ever given anything to the cause. Doesn't matter if you're a millionaire who kept our lights on every year or somebody who donated a spare tip a grand total of once. The amount a person can spare is relative. The value of generosity is not. All those little cobbles were enough to pave the road back to Luna, then to Mars and the asteroid belt and beyond. I tried to find my name on the wall. I'd given all my beer money to an Oka employee I heard speak at school four months prior, but the lights came back before I located myself. I was returned to the world of tendrils and worms, fungus and rock, locked together in an unbreakable web. Viewed in this way, you can never again see a tree as a single entity, despite its visual dominance. It towers. It's impressive. But in the end, it's a fragile endeavor that can only stand thanks to the contributions of many. We celebrate the tree that stretches to the sky, but it is the ground we should ultimately thank. Oh my God.
That is amazing. That's a that's a hard thing to listen to right now. <laughs> <It's beautiful>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to hear that in Dublin when we were all at Worldcon. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And it was stunning then, and it's even more now. I know. Right now, it's just like everybody sigh and sing and help each other. <laughs> Oh my god, my feelings yeah. are real. Everybody <laughs> needs to read this book right now. Oh yeah, no, the 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 chat is agreeing. Everybody's like, deep breaths, everybody. Deep breaths. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah, let's talk about to be taught or fortunate. Um, I that I don't I'm not an author so I don't like like the process is a big mysterious black box to me and I, I like that a little bit but like is there an origin story for this book like like did, did this come from something in particular yes so the thing with any book is that I like I, I liken it to making dinner out of whatever leftovers you have in the fridge so you often have like one idea but then you're kind of grabbing bits and pieces of whatever else you've gathered that year or whatever the time period may be. So um, so part of this is just um, a, a long standing, uh, like slow burn existential angst about the future <laughs> of, of human space flight and where we're going with that. But um, the like the, the trigger point I can point to is I was at a, a fantastic uh, sci-fi conference in Hong Kong called Melon, which is awesome. It's, um, it's, they bring in uh, sci-fi authors and real scientists, and you just get half an hour to talk about whatever you want. And then you all get to mingle together, which is really cool because science and science fiction are so um, symbiotic. You know, we feed off of each other constantly, but we don't always get a ton of time to interact with each other. And uh, I met a scientist there named uh, Lisa Nip, who at the time was a, uh, a PhD candidate at MIT Media Lab. And her field is, um, so she's a, she's a, a synthetic biologist, which is basically someone who uh, plays with DNA for life. <laughs> if we're gonna explain it really, really quickly. Um, and uh, so her whole idea is, um, what if instead of um, trying to figure out a technological solution for having humans in space long term, um, which is, you know, the biggest challenge about human space flight, you've got um, the long term effects of gravity and radiation exposure and, and how do you keep people fed and healthy and all of these things. Um, she, her argument was, you know, instead of instead of coming up with complex uh, machinery or terraforming other worlds? What if we quote unquote terraform ourselves? What if we um, give ourselves um, little, you know, genetic tweaks that would enable us to live, to, to, to adapt um, better to the, the challenges of, of space or other planets? And it, she, when she spoke about it, it was so beautiful and it was so moving and just so radically simple in that she wasn't talking about some sort of transhumanist, like let's create a new species or like, let's do this because, you know, we have to leave the planet because it's our only choice. She was saying, what if we just, just make a few little changes to ourselves um, so that we can go out there and explore. And I uh, was my reaction to that. <laughs> and um and so I thought, well, that's, that's, I want to write about that. I want to write about um, that idea. And she was kind enough to Skype with me a couple of times uh, after the conference, she was in her lab and it was very cool. Um, <laughs> and she, she uh, walked me through all my, my noob questions about it. Cause I'm not a scientist uh, by training. And, uh, and so I just, I, I took that idea and, and, and ran with it I, and, and, and applied that to a, a crew of astronauts and, and their travels. And so there's a lot of other things that are in the book as well. There's lots of ingredients, but that was the, um, the progenitor sort of moment of, of where it all came from. Yeah, I mean, there is so much technology, like in addition to the soma forming in the book and then like the, all the different aliens that happen and like the different, world. it's just so cool. Like, have you ever wanted to write anything other than sci-fi? Like that seems like those ingredients are so present in everything you do, like the different worlds. Yeah, it's it's just um, 
I don't know, sci-fi is, is where my roots are. Yeah. I think the only thing I could, I could see myself doing fantasy at some point because I, I in my free time, I love me some high fantasy. Mm. I really do. Um, but I don't feel like I have anything new to contribute at the moment. You know, like I, I want to leave that door open, but I feel like any fantasy story I write now would just be like a thinly veiled version of whatever D&D character I'm really excited <laughs> about at the moment. So that's not really... Which is what a lot of good fantasy books have You know, been you know, <laughs> Dragonlance exists. So, um, yeah, so it's something I, I could see myself going in that direction, but otherwise sci-fi is just a language I really, really love. That's awesome. I mean, this book, like your other ones, also has a really wonderful, like, kind of fa- found family story, which, of course, for, you know, a lot of us and especially like the queers and people among us are just like yes 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 thank you very mm-hmm. much I will curl up inside this book and like, <laughs> um even like when when bad things happen it just kind of makes you comfortable like I, your 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 books have a bit of like people are smart and they're take care of each other in a way like and it feels nice like is that is that something you think about when you write it's just like this is nice (laughs) it's very intentional I mean on the one hand for starters I think most people are smart and most people do take care of each other and so I I think that those are those are very human traits that are are worth highlighting um but yeah the um that sort of comfort is is something I do very intentionally which is not to say that everything in my books is comfortable there's a lot of really scary or creepy stuff that happens but ultimately I I want to um I want to leave you with a sense of hope you know I think that science fiction is such a a powerful I mean I'm biased but I think it's such a powerful medium in that it um it 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 shows us what the future could be. And if all we're talking about are futures that are uncomfortable or scary, then we won't want to go to them, you know? But if you if you tell stories about futures that feel hopeful and possible and a, a place you could live, even though bad things still happen, because that's just life, you know, if it's if it's a place where you're like, I could live there, I could, I could be in that future. Um, I, I think that's um that's so important right now, uh, especially when things are um, a bit grim. Uh, you know, we we need to have a compass to point ourselves toward. You know, we need to have um, something where we could say, "Well, okay, this right now is tough, but what's going to make the struggle work it worth it? What kind of world are we working toward?" Um, and that's that's what I try to do with my work. That's wonderful. Oh my gosh, I have so many more questions for you, Becky, but time is going fast. So I'm going to I'm gonna switch a little bit to Wayfarers now. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, we already talked about like the beginnings of this book, which is great, um, or the series, but I want to ask you uh, about the, because these books, unlike the um, To Be Taught a Fortunate, have, uh, have a, a whole world of these like a galactic commons of different alien species, uh, which are just so cool. And they all deal with like gender differently and relationships differently and societal structures differently. And I just want to, if you I ask, if you could talk about like how you develop that, those worlds. There's I would, so much. I would like to talk about nothing better. Invi- <laughs> inventing aliens is my favorite thing in the whole world. <laughs> um, I, uh, yeah, I mean, that's the great thing about sci-fi, right, is that you can just have a blank slate and you can just get rid of all the the assumptions and taboos and, um, you know, and just say, well, what if this? What if that? And people are like, yeah, it's got scales on it. That's fine then. Um, so um, I always start with aliens with biology. Uh, Mother Nature is my biggest inspiration. I could never do anything as weird as nature does on its own. Like, it's just, you can't you can't make that stuff up. Um, so, and I'm always like, uh, sponging up, you know, nature shows and nonfiction books or, you know, and I love aquariums and the zoo and hiking and all these sorts of things. So it it usually starts with whatever thing I'm like hyper fixated on at the moment, be it, uh, you know, uh, cephalopod chromatophores or, uh, eggs or, you know, whatever, whatever thing it is. I'm like, oh, that's neat. And so I'll start with that. Egg laying is a great, is a great example. Um, so you start with, let's say you have a a civilization level species that lays, lays eggs 
instead of giving live birth as we do. Um, okay, so if you, instead of having to like carry an infant inside of you, if you can just leave it somewhere and it's going to hatch fully formed and you don't have to carry it around for two years and it can just walk around and feed itself. What does that change about your concept of motherhood? What does that change about your concept of family, of childhood? Uh, and, and from those, those affect everything, right? How does that affect your architecture? How does that affect your art? How does that affect the kind of homes you build? How does that affect um, uh, everything, everything, everything? Um, you can boil down to biological needs, you know, uh, whether it's that or, um, you know, I have a species that uh, doesn't um, naturally speak like verbally and they lack a sense of hearing, they communicate through color. And so how does that change their art? How does that make them feel if they walk into a room that's painted in murals? Is it all yelling at them? That kind of thing. Um, I could give a million examples of this because it's, <laughs> yeah. I get so excited about it, but it's, <laughs> Um, but those, those are the sorts of rabbit holes I, I dive down when I'm, when I'm making new alien cultures. That's amazing. Uh, Becky, I read that you have your own wiki, your local wiki for I do. Wayfarers lore. I do. I've written so much and so much stuff that I will never use or that I might use at some point. Yeah. And also because, um, you know, I'm three novels in and I'm working on the fourth right now and <laughs> Yeah. um don't get excited it's not done yet it's I'm in, not it's excited in, it's in that phase where I just want to set it on fire but it's fine um okay. yeah, yeah I don't care I don't care finish um, it right now whatever <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah so it's gotten to the point where I have to be able to keep things straight or else I'm gonna get letters um as you know as we do um yeah. so uh yeah so I have a, I have a locally hosted wiki where I keep all of my um, you know, uh, history of different species and biological things and what I've established about, you know, uh, art styles or, you know, technology use or blah, 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 all, all the nitty gritty. Um, it's very useful. Absolutely. That's, That's awesome. So That's so nerdy. I'm so into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Becky, can we talk about robots now? I would love to talk about robots. <laughs> okay. I love um, robots so much. <laughs> do you have like, what, what, do you have favorite robots? Like fiction, reality, oh, what, what is robots? Like, yeah. What does robot mean to you? What is robot? Oh, do we have like five hours? <laughs> oh um, no. <laughs> nope. What does robot? <laughs> no, <laughs> what the novella version. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, favorite robots. I mean, data, I think is, is my, my first, of course. Um, yeah. I mean, who doesn't, who, like Absolutely. what of us like 80s, 90s kids don't Absolutely. love Data? Well, and Data and R2-D2, I mean, those were my my mm -hmm. two best friends growing up. So um, yeah, I've just always been drawn to them and I don't know why. I wish I could give you a nice succinct reason for why I love robots so much, why I want to be a robot. So, like if somebody could upload my brain into a robot or a computer, like absolutely sign me up. I have no qualms about that whatsoever. I um, can tell you why I want to be a robot. <laughs> tell me why you want to be a robot. Oh, it's a lot of free. Uh, no, that's great though. Yeah. Like okay. yeah, robots are the best. <laughs> they really are. They really yeah. are. Um, I love to think about, I love to think about how robots think. I love to think mm -hmm. about um, what separates us from them. You know, I mean, besides, obviously, you know, we're biological, they're organic, but like at, at what point, um, you know, we talk about, oh, well, they're, you know, they're just programmed to feel that way or blah, 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 but aren't we the same? You know, aren't we just all these, uh, you know, unseen processes of if thens and, and chemical ones and zeros, do you know what I mean? So it, it's, um, I, I, I love robots dearly. I have no conclusion to this statement. I'm just very no, excited about them. No, I mean, them. that's great. Like, like the, so the Closed in Common Orbit, which mm -hmm. is the book that has- It's like a very two, robot heavy book. It's a very robot heavy. It has two prominent AIs in mm -hmm. it. And like, so I guess, I mean, we've kind of just talked about like why you wanted to, to write a story about with like this AI main character and, and Sidra is just amazing. Do you have anything? Do you want to talk about Sidra at all? I can totally talk about Sidra. So Sidra is, uh, without giving too much away, um, Sidra is an AI who is originally designed to um, 
uh, basically be the monitoring system for a spaceship. And um, so that's that's what she's designed for. She's designed to be housed in a ship and to have lots of different cameras. And, you know, that's that's the kind of body she understands. And through circumstances, um, she ends up being installed in in essentially an Android. Um, it's called a body kit. And um, she has to get used to that sort of existence instead and so it's her story so there's there's two different storylines in the book and her and hers is very much focused on her um coming to terms with this body that she didn't choose for herself and learning how to perceive the world differently um learning how to um interact in in uh spaces that are designed for humans and other species and definitely don't uh, keep her in mind also because she's illegal like she's not supposed to be there um, and uh, and if, it, if she gets found out she's in a, in a lot of trouble so um, it's it's a story about her getting used to both a form and a society that were not her choice but she has to make her way in anyway so yeah it's amazing <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and, and you, were, you talked about this a little bit, but it has like these stories of like, she was programmed to like prioritize other people's needs above her own. And that's mm. like, that sounds familiar as, yeah. like, you know, and it's just like, the, the, and, and then also like having to reclaim her own body and like this, the like kind of the narrative with tattoos and stuff like that. It's just like, when you take these real human moments and then they're in sci-fi and then you read them and then you read them like, 12 more times and and it's just like it's just like it, it helps people process stuff it's really cool like are you are you processing stuff as well when you're writing it or are you like is it something that's like okay I have a list of really important smart Becky things I want to put in a book and then I'm going to tell it fix everybody's lives I would love it if I had a list of smart <laughs> things I have no idea what I'm doing at any point ever um I often am processing things without realizing I'm processing things um mm. or or I may I may have something that I'm drawing from yeah. but not in an, in an intentional like this is the moral of the story sort of way it's it's the you know, I, I may connect, I, 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 I try to find connections with characters who are obviously w way different than me. I don't know what it's like to be an AI stuck in a body and you only have one pair of eyes and, you know, I, no mm -hmm. one knows what that's like, but I can relate to the experience of not being happy with the body that I have or looking in the mirror and saying, this doesn't feel right. Or, looking at you know having the world tell you you need to be this and you're like but I'm not this I'm that and I don't I don't want to be this so there are commonalities in those things so that those those sorts of experiences with Sidra in particular you know are things I'm drawing from in my real life and just sort of put them through a funhouse mirror and um you know make it about robots instead but I think that you know you the thing <laughs> <laughs> the thing you said about, you know, being able to process it, I think is one of the things I love most about science fiction is that when you um, take these ideas and take them out of your everyday context, it makes them a little, it makes it easier to engage with um, concepts that may be uncomfortable or may hit really close to home um, because you're, you have that little bit of separation, right? You have that, um, that nice comforting blanket of fiction around it and and you're willing to suspend your disbelief and you're willing to just sort of surrender yourself to the story it makes it i think easier to um engage very intimately with with these sorts of things in a way that feels safe and that you can distance yourself as much as you want to you know if you if you want to see yourself in a character like Sidra or any of the other characters you can do that but if it if it does hit too close to home yeah you can you can say oh it's just robots i don't need to you know so it's it's you know you you can you can choose your own comfort level with it which i think yeah. makes it easier for people to um get as close as they want to ideas or not yeah yeah no it's a it's awesome such a good character uh <laughs> uh oh, okay deep breath um just all right <laughs> this let's uh i have i have one more set of questions which are um, well, kind of related to the times right now, which is that I know that you are a, a, a self-employed work from home person, or at least mm -hmm. you, you've been writing books. Like, do you have a routine? Do you have any tips for people who are 
writing yes. or working from home right now? <laughs> Let me give you my tips. First of all, yeah. put on pants. It's really important mm. that you put on nor I know. <laughs> I know. I don't I like put on, I put on pants today for you, Becky. So oh, thank you so yeah, much. I've got absolutely. pants on too. I could <laughs> not right now. It could be, yeah. oh, this could be a ruse, but no, I am wearing pants. I assure you. Um, so I, it's really, really important to establish a routine. And that doesn't mean like strict marching orders. Cause I personally don't do well with that at all. And you have to work with your own rhythms as well. I am not a person who gets up at eight in the morning. I'm just not, you know, so First of all, figure out how you like to work, what times of day you like to work, you know, when do you like to go to bed, this and that, but then find that and stick to it. Get up, you know, wash your face, take a shower, put on some clothes, have breakfast, you know, present yourself as a, a normal human. My rule is always like, um, be able to answer the door. That, I mean, that's a, that's a really low baseline, but like yeah. be able to answer the door. Um, and, uh, you know, with, so start there. Always, I also think it's important to go into the day with um, an intention as to what you want to accomplish. You may not get there and that's okay, but, you know, just, just start, I always start the day with what is it I'm working on today? You know, I'm working on this chapter and I'm going to try to get to here. You know, it's these, these, this little goals along the way that help you um, keep it going and obviously take breaks talk to other humans um, you know the internet is great for that drink lots of water eat your vegetables all these important things and also I, the the biggest challenge at home is separating um, work time and chill time right because mm -hmm. you're in your place of work um, for me I'm very lucky in that I have a home office now but I didn't used to and so it's really, really important, even if it's just a, a corner of your kitchen table, that that's your workspace and you don't use it for anything else. So that when you go chill out in the living room or something, you know, you don't want to associate your couch with um, the place where you both, you know, watch Netflix and work because then it all just feels like the same thing. You know, it's even if you have a small space, make sure that you're, um, you know, sort of finding variety in your environment as much as possible. I like that. That's, I gotta say, Becky, the, the chat has been extremely positive towards you this whole time. Lots of like worship, lots of compliments on your books. And as soon as you said you have to wear pants, they just turned on you. I'm so sorry. It's just- Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Well, shoot. Okay. There no, went I'm, my I, career. <laughs> it's over. It's, it's, no, it's, it's done. They're, they're, they're coming around. Okay. Um, uh, but they also they can be oh, comfy pants. I'm not wearing I, jeans I, right now. These are yoga pants. Like, let's okay. be real. Well, I think that that's oh, okay. That's, <laughs> that's that's gonna yeah. turn. I think you're gonna they're gonna come back. Um, what games are you playing right now? What am I playing right now? I'm playing so much Stardew Valley right now because it chills me out, and um, that's what we all need yes. in these times. Um, I also just finished up. Uh, the Witcher 3 because I watched the show and the game is not like the show but it was enough like the show that I could <laughs> play it for a million hours um, mm -hmm. and I also the thing that is absolutely saving my life right now is uh, I have a um, so there is a Dragon Age uh, pen and paper role-playing uh, system um, by Green Ronin and I have an amazing group that I have been playing a campaign with and we're in our fifth year and we, we <gasps> wow. play, we play on roll 20, which is perfect right now because we can't go anywhere, but we're all in different States and it is uh, my favorite thing in the whole world. So that is, I, I, I care about it more than my books. So let's. What's your character like? If <laughs> you don't mind sharing. Sure. So um, I play a character named Elodie and she is, uh, a Norwegian exile. Um, she was supposed to be a chevalier, but she got kicked out of the academy and is now, um, she's now uh, hoofing it around Ferelden with the rest of her mercenary pals. Um, she's very not like me. <laughs> she's very, <laughs> she's very fussy and she's very, um, uh, snobby about things, but in a, yeah. a way I think is endearing, but then I'm biased. So, um, she's, she's all about that, that honor and chivalry and, and stuff, but is constantly making bad decisions. So that's fun. Yeah. 
it's a lot of fun. <laughs> I'm very, nice. I'm, it's my goal to get any interview I'm in to turn around and let me talk her about Dragon Age at some point. Yeah. This is my secret agenda. I mean, the rest of this interview was just an excuse to get you to get to that. To get question. here. So, yeah. So, right. That's all um, I need. Uh, so, uh, do you have any like book recommendations? Do you read books as people who like <laughs> your books? Read books. Uh, yes. Um, I, so the best thing I've read this year by far is um, This is How You Lose the Time War. I already which, read that one. I'm, it's really good. It's so good. It's <laughs> That's so two good. recommendations it's, now. <laughs> it's one of those books where you, you like kind of like hold it up against your face at the end and you're, you just want to absorb it like into yeah. your being it's so good um i also i read a lot of nonfiction um because at the end of the day if i've been working on a book all day the absolute last thing in the world i want to do is pick up a book yeah. um so uh what am i reading right now i just finished a great book called dr space junk versus the universe which is about uh so it's about space junk and it's about the potential future archaeological value of space junk and how we need to think about um space junk not only as uh like an environmental problem we need to clean up but also as artifacts of the space age and of our current space age not just the space race but of now and um whether there should be um ways to preserve some of that stuff rather than just you know letting it burn up and it was a totally brilliant thought-provoking read so if you like space stuff i totally recommend it that sounds great uh all right well i have uh one last question which i bet you expect which is um if you'd like to answer what what is next what is current what is coming what is what should people becky chambers fans in the crowd (laughs) what are they what are we waiting for oh i've got so much stuff coming so this i don't have anything coming out this year because this year i am writing all this stuff um you just want a hugo take a break Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm work as mentioned. I'm working on the next Wayfarers book. It does not have a title yet. It should be out early next year. Um, and uh, I also have two novellas coming from Tor.com, which are a completely different thing. I'm writing solar punk for them. So I'm amazing. I, yeah, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Much as I love, yeah. much as I love spaceships, it's very. And there's a robot in that one too so Yay! you'll get get, get <laughs> hype um so those are those are the the projects i've got um on various burners at the moment awesome great yeah um anybody watching there are links uh to becky's books in the description of this video indie bound uh and amazon links so please go um read them all uh yes. before you try to talk to us again um and uh yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you everybody uh, so much for watching and stay tuned. The Double Clicks will be back in about 15 minutes for a live stream Jackbox games with the Library Bards and Paul and Storm and some other amazing people. So, uh, yay, thank you, Becky. Thank you so much. This was so much fun. Absolutely. Stop in the live stream. Bye, everybody. <laughs>